Welcome to the Silver Swan Show, episode one. My name's Philippa from Silver Swan Recruitment, and I am joined today by Russell Orford. Russell, how do you feel about being guest number one? I'm um, <laughs> very privileged and uh, a little bit nervous, but it'll be fine. It'll be good. <laughs> it's either a, a position of honour to be asked first or being used as a guinea pig. Uh, Absolutely, in, bit of both, bit of both. <laughs> bit of both. Who knows how episode one's going to go? It's a learning curve for all of us. But um, the reason I wanted to bring Russell on the show is because Russell has uh, joined the industry from uh, an unusual type of background. A lot of people think you have to have a background in hospitality uh, to be considered uh, for a role in the private sector. But there are ways that people doing, you know, very different things are able to transition into the industry. So I thought Russell was a good person to kick the show off, to give people a bit of, a bit of an insight uh, as to what he was doing before and how he made the transition and sort of where that t journey took him really. So Russell, do you want to give us a bit of a background as to what you were doing before you joined uh, the private sector? Yeah, so before I joined, I was a French horn player in the army. I was in the Scots Guards band. I wore a red tunic and a black bearskin. I did the changing of the guard and the trooping the colour and things like that. And I did that for 12 years before naturally reaching a point in my career where it was a good time to retire, as it were, um, at 30 and then working out what I wanted to do from there. And did you uh, know anything about the private sector at this stage? I knew bits and pieces, not a great deal. Um, my wife's in hospitality. Uh, my family has members who have been in uh, high-end luxury hospitality as well. And so I'd been exposed to it, but the inner workings, not really, no. Okay, so an unusual path for you to have chosen. So it was what a was strange the Yeah, go on, what happened then after, uh, when you made the decision you were gonna retire from the army, what were your, so what was your thought process and what were your steps? Okay, so when you're in the army, you have a 12 month notice period. Wow. So you hand your notice in and then you've got a year mm. to wait. And it's, yeah. it's a really long time um, because you can't apply for any jobs. You almost can't even think of doing jobs because no one's going to offer you a job and wait for 12 months. Yeah, of course. Um, but it came about purely, you, there are different roles within the, within the band. Um, you're not just playing the French horn. Um, I was in charge of computers, I was in charge of the, the music library at one point. And what I did for a few years was I was an orderly for the bandmaster and the director of music, which is basically valet duties, um, looking after their uniform, making sure the right bits of kids are in the right place at the right time for the right parades. And um, yeah, it's kind of the valet side of, of butlering and house managing, that, that sort of thing. And it just so happened that the director of music one day said, you know what, Russell, you'd make a bloody good butler to somebody one day. Mm -hmm. And that was it, it was a passing comment. Didn't think anything more of it. And then five years later when I left, I thought, well, let's, let's have a look. Let's kind of, let's explore that. And then I kind of jumped ahead. When I was still in my last, last few months, my last summer of the army, a friend of my wife's who was a PA to a titled lady in Chelsea, um, yeah, she was just chatting to her and said, "Oh, we've got a we've got a girl who looks after their property five yeah five kind of half days a week, and um, so five afternoons a week, flexi time, just as and when she can do it." Um, but she's going on maternity leave for a few months. Don't suppose you know of anybody who could help out? Mm. And my wife went, "Oh, Russell can Russell's think about getting into that sort of thing. Why don't you have a chat with him?" And so that was that was my very first job. I was still I was still in the army. I, I didn't really have very much experience. I didn't have a CV, didn't have anything. I went and met this PA for a coffee and the, the lady of the house owned a restaurant and met, met this girl for a coffee in the restaurant. And she said, oh, do you want to meet, do you want to meet the principal? Mm. And that was it. I got sat down and the principal said, oh, so have you got your CV? I said, no, I was, I was only here for a coffee. I, I wasn't prepared for this. This wasn't happening two hours ago. Mm. And, um, but that was it. We got on, she liked me, I liked her and, I started at the at the house on the on the Monday. I don't think she realised how little I knew. Um, yeah. But that was it. Yeah, looking after a lord and lady, a large house in Chelsea, which is actually two townhouses not together. Um, and it was a fantastic opening. Um, and I literally did changing the guard in the morning, and then went down there in the afternoon and looked after their house. It was. And this was a part time was, job alongside the army. 
Absolutely, yeah. It was mm. part time, just right place, right time. Yeah, grabbed it in both hands and and went from there. Uh, and from there, I did a, did a little bit of ex military recruitment um, because that five months flexi time household manager stuff it wasn't enough to get me a proper job yeah. um and i'd seen from that point that that's kind of what i wanted to do i didn't want to go in as an under butler and and also i didn't have time i was i was 30 i'd got a young child mm. a wife a mortgage a house i didn't i didn't have time to start right at the bottom um yeah and did a bit of ex-military recruitment, which got me better at writing my CV and working out what my transferable skills from the army brought to the household management and why it made me good at it. Um, and then, yes, I managed to force a, uh, an agency into putting me forward for an interview um, for a role. They said, no, it's three years experience minimum. And I said, no, I've done a little bit of recruitment. I know that, that that's my job. Mm. And so they put me forward. I interviewed for it the next day met the principal the day after and got it um and that was that was a serious baptism of fire um the, mm. it was when i look back now i no idea how how i did it but it was it was, high, it was, it was fantastic. High, high profile principal wasn't it your first one so it, it was, was a very high pro, very high profile ultra high net worth yeah ultra demanding he was never unreasonable or oh, i don't think he was unreasonable but everything he wanted he wanted it perfect it was either perfect or it's wrong yeah um and that apparently was the line that got me the job when he asked me what standards the guards brought in and kind of instilled in me and i said well it's, things are either perfect or they're wrong mm -hmm. and apparently that was that was the thing that got me the job um i think it's um i think it's good for people to sort of hear your story because what the agency told you we need in three years experience i hear that all the time we get mm. we get tons of candidates that come to civil recruitment who are wanting to get into the industry and they just get door shut in the face because they haven't got any experience without a huge amount of advice on where or how to go get that experience and um yeah it's it's difficult but i think the uh, well you, you obviously had a good relationship with the agent and uh was convincing enough on your ability to do the role enough to even get you put forward. So um, yeah, a bit of uh, confidence in yourself, I think is needed at the early stages, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, I mean, the conversation, she just said, you don't have enough experience. I said, yeah. I will get this job. Put me forward, I said, worst case, they just reply and say, no. He hasn't got enough experience. Yeah, yeah. That doesn't have enough experience. And, that, and then that's fine. I said, but you get me in front of them and I'll get this job. Yeah, you know what, we have, you know, I think the military background is so much more valuable than people think. We have clients that seek out a military background um, and mm. the skills that you have and the training you've had and the discipline that you've got, I think translates so well to private household. And clients that don't know that are missing out. And there are, yeah. I know, we get clients, especially who are looking for the sort of security, chauffeury element, uh, you know, they is getting more and more popular for clients to say we would love anybody that's got a military background so um absolutely it's good for people to know that hey yeah and there's there's a, there's a couple of things that aren't even directly involved that just the army just gives you which is you come out with a very thick skin yeah you never seek praise you don't you don't need it you don't expect it you know if you've done a good job and that's enough and if the client wants to have a have a go at you you know that it's not personal they just want to vent and you're and you're there but it doesn't matter and you can walk out and and forget about it so long as it is just them venting and not having to go at you you're very used to shouldering responsibility and just and the answer is yes the answer is always yes and then if you don't know how to do it you figure out how to do it very very quickly mm. but and that and that's something for me that has worked very very well whether it's been going into a job in my first role in of my first job in one of the roles they sat me down and said right first thing we need you to do is we need you to organize replumbing our swimming pool mm. i didn't know how to replumb a swimming pool i didn't know much about swimming pool plumbing but i said yeah absolutely leave it with me and two days later i knew all about swimming pool plumbing i've got meetings booked tender reviews and talked it through in different systems but when they said it i didn't have a clue mm. but they don't want to know that but the clients just want to know that it's in your hands now and that they can trust you with it yeah and so long as you say yeah absolutely not a problem leave it with me and they believe that 
then then you can go and discuss it because also quite often what they're asking for might not be what they need mm. they th they think they know what exactly what they need but they don't understand the workings of a swimming pool or what would work in that environment or whatever they just they've got something in their head but then it's your job to explain to them what is the best way the, uh, the best way of doing that mm. um but that's the sort of thing that the army gives you that confidence in your own ability to go and to go and figure it out and that i don't know everything now I, I never will know everything and there's always surprises every day but i know how to find out and i know how to and that's all, that's all the client wants and i think that's the biggest thing that the military gave me yeah you're also very well presented all the time you know how to iron um very high <laughs> levels of attention to detail i know that one of your principals uh was looking for that oh he was yeah and and a lot of that came from the army but yes when i was doing his doing his dressing room it came naturally to me and made sense that i would equally space all the coat hangers you and i would ruler. measure it out with a ruler I, I would me say again with a ruler i would measure it out i, I use my finger so i would literally space out put them between the coat hangers and space out because the three middle ones were the same spacing so i'd measure them out and equally space every single coat hanger in the uh, in the wardrobe i'll take out any empty ones but that's i mean that's that's kind of normal but it came naturally to me it made sense to me to use a laser level and fire it straight down the table to line everything up perfectly mm. um it made sense that the best way to present the newspaper was to wind them beforehand because then they would look at their best and those are the things that he expected but the guards gave that to me the, mm looking for how can i always make this better how can it how can it be more perfect mm. um but yeah no those those are things that that he wanted that he expected and and he noticed mm. he noticed everything um mm. we had we had one day where we had a dinner party and dinner parties were busy days started at seven in the morning on the friday and generally finished at about three o'clock in the morning on the saturday working straight through generally didn't sit down it was solid busy 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 day um, and everything had to be perfectly ready for the dinner party at about six o'clock because he would generally come through the door at six and although the guests wouldn't arrive until 7 30 he might walk through the door and give me an hour and a half's worth of work to do so everything had to be perfect candles had to be lit fragrance had to be sprayed around everything had to be ready to go at six and we had a dinner party and he didn't come back until 7 30 as the guests were were pulling up and in his entrance hall, he had three massive, great big pillar candles, the, the things that last for six months. Um, and so I'd lit them at six. And he walked through the door at 7.30, went upstairs, got changed, came back down, did the dinner party, everything was fine. Entertainment, bar, uh, singers, full service, the whole nine yards. And, uh, and then at the end, at about three o'clock in the morning when he went to bed, he turned around and said, Good job tonight, Russell. Everything was great. But when I came in, the length of the wicks on those candles, that was a bit, they're a bit long. <laughs> and, and the only reason they were long was because they'd been lit at six. And if he'd walked through the door at six as normal, it would have been fine. Um, and there would have been a normal trimmed length. But because they've been lit for an hour and a half, they're a bit longer. But he noticed. I was just going to say, oh. I don't think I have ever noticed how long a wick is on a candle when you then have the most amazing dinner party of all the things that just goes mm -hmm. to show, like, you know, I always think that people, you know, these type of clients, they're not, they haven't got to where they've got by accident. You know, no. they're not lucky. They have, they've got to where they've got because they're incredibly successful. And to be incredibly successful, a lot of the traits are very, very similar. You know, they are very <laughs> ambitious. They're very hard work and they're very driven. Their levels of attention to detail are insane. They're, yeah, they don't um, accept things that are substandard. Yeah. They, they, they really don't. And part of, for a split second when he, when he said it, I mean, I was tired. I was a bit buzzing because we, we've done it, it'd been really good. And then to have that little snip taken away for, for a split second, I just thought, I'm crying out loud, really? <laughs> and, then, and then I just thought, actually, if that's what we're down to, if that is the only thing out of, yeah, out of the last, however, however long it is, out of the last 18 hours or so that you can pick up on, fine, I'll, I'll take that. That's absolutely fine.
Um, and I know that it wasn't anything that I'd actually done wrong. It was just a matter of circumstance and you think, mm. fine. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, but that's what he was like. Everything had to be perfect and he noticed everything. I wonder and if he's nothing the kind of, was going to be the kind of person that um, maybe through his career uh, and always trying to improve and what he's doing, there'll never be a situation where everything was perfect. So he, no. had, to, he had to think of something. And like Absolutely. I said, that's all, that's all he could think of. Fair enough, it's mental that he even noticed it. That's crazy. But if that is all he could think of, then that's, like I say, really good going. But it, it, that's, where, that's where the thick-skinned element comes mm. into having to work in this industry because I don't think anything will ever be perfect. I don't think you'll ever be told in your job that was the that was perfection. I think you will always get that was great and there'll always be an, an area but, of improvement, which is probably yeah. how, you know, if you can deal with that, great for you to develop, you know, you're always going to improve. If you're told you're amazing all day long, how are you ever going to, you know, go from mm. that? Yeah, no, no, absolutely. There, there is no room for complacency. There's no, no room for sitting on your laurels. Um, we we had a barbecue one time and he, yeah, he said, yeah, we're going to have a barbecue this weekend. Um, yeah, between, just a small one, just between eight and 12 people, just, just a few close friends coming around. Perfect. So I spoke with the chef and we got a couple of the housekeepers in to help out. Um, and we budgeted for 20 people. We expected there to be a few more. We expected 20 people. And it topped out at 65 people turned up and walked through the door. <laughs> and we were just, they just kept on coming in, just kept on coming in. I was like, what on earth are we, how are we going to manage this? And 65, we didn't have a barman. We didn't have enough ice. We didn't, they all started drinking mojitos and we didn't have nearly enough mint. We, we we were running out of food. We were having to do very fast trips down the road to the to the supermarket to, to just buy anything we could get off the shelves. It was, it was, yeah, it was crazy, really crazy. So stressful. But, but, yeah, oh, incredibly stressful. Um, and then all of a sudden, um, yeah, it all it all finished. It all kind of went fine. We managed. Nobody was without. Even when. They decided to do shots of tequila. They hadn't drunk tequila in a year and a half of them working there. But in an hour and a half, they got through five bottles of tequila. Mm. Um, but luckily, we, we did keep very good stocks. Um, we were down to our last bottle, which would have been a very expensive one. But they were just doing shots of tequila and they were just drinking it. So luckily, we, we had enough. But yes, the, the next day when, when he sat down and came down for breakfast, he said, yeah, barbecue. He said, you didn't feel very well prepared for that. You he didn't it didn't feel very smooth i said no, no i'm not surprised he said yeah you you said eight to twelve we we budgeted for 20 and there ended up being 65 and his reply was that's not my problem is it mm -hmm. um <laughs> and again you just go no absolutely not terribly sorry won't happen again um and but but if we'd budgeted and bought yeah bought fillets of beef for 65 people and only 12 turned up he'd have gone absolutely mental so it's all there's always a balance and you just gotta have a very thick skin and he knew he knew yeah. that that it was his that he dropped the ball and he maybe should have mentioned that there was going to be a few more people but yeah his mistake my fault he's not going to admit it yeah of course you know what this is why i love this industry so much like and this is why i really want to do this podcast because the favorite part of my job is talking to people that do this day in day out and it just blows my mind. I, every day I feel like I've heard it all. And then I'll, get, I'll speak to somebody else and I hear a different story from a different household. And you guys are just superhuman. Like, I, I'm obviously involved in the industry from a recruitment point of view, but I just don't think I could do it. I don't think I could do it. I don't think it's for me. It's just, it's just another level. I have so much respect for people that work in the private sector because it's just hard and relentless and thankless obviously yeah. very rewarding at the same time but it's not as glamorous as people think and it's so challenging not at all um one of my jobs with a previous client he had some very fast cars and he didn't drive them very often but they needed driving they needed miles putting on the clock and so part of my job was to take them around take them around the block um and just to keep them going and so you're driving around in this incredible car with hundreds of thousands of pounds just on your own, just to take it for a run, which was amazing. And then you'd come back and then you'd be teaching the housekeepers how to clean the toilets two minutes later. <laughs> so real, real highs and lows. It's a very, very grounding job. There's some amazing parts of it, but 
yeah, it, it brings you back to earth very, very quickly. Very, yeah. very quickly. You, you are there to, to facilitate their lives. It's, yeah, none of that is yours. It's when purely you step out of the, When you step off the private jet or step out of the Lamborghini and then find out to your cleaning plug holes with toothpicks, you know, or toilet with toothbrushes. It's, uh, yeah, <laughs> like you say, it keeps you grounded. So let's bring us up to today then. So what, what's your current situation? Like what's, what's your life, what does your life look like now? So I currently, um, my title would be house slash estate manager. It, it gets very flexible at, um, at this sort of level now. So I look after a gentleman um, who is in the country anywhere between 90 and 120 days a year, ultra, ultra high net worth. Um, and we have, a, we have seven properties across London. We have his, his son's, um, then few properties for staff. We've just taken on a new one um, to basically build a laundry in it because there aren't his place isn't big enough and doesn't have the facilities. So we're, we've, we've got a new property and we're currently in the process of putting building a laundry in that. Um, and just managing those, some for their friends or his son's friends, dealing with the lease negotiations um, and and their properties. And so there are many different aspects to all of the properties. He is very much number one and prime, our prime concern and area of attention. Um, when he's in the country, it's full on. Um, mm. It's my days are probably seven till midnight, um, but he's only there for two or three days a week. Um, but during that time, we are, we are there. Um, we have, a, I look after a team of 10, I think, um, about 10 of us uh, in the country, um, housekeepers, butlers, uh, chefs, drivers, and I kind of look after all of them and all of the different, uh, the different properties as well. And then I liaise, it's a, it's a vast network of household staff, it's a massive operation. Um, mm -hmm. I'm one of nearly 200 private staff worldwide, um, yeah. just, in his, just in his properties, playing boats and that sort of thing. Mm. Um, and so it's liaising with everybody else. Where are his clothes? What's gone where? If he's taken stuff from one property and it's gone to another, has that gone into another one? Does it need to come back to us? Um, all of his food comes from certain places around the world. And so we need to make sure that each property has enough of that. Um, so it's liaising with all of the other properties. And his, his plans change. They change so quickly. Do you ever know um, when he's coming? Say again? Do you ever know when he's coming? I will hopefully always get 24 hours notice. <laughs> um, but at the minute with, uh, yeah, with the current situation with COVID-19, he went straight over to a property that he has over, over in the Caribbean. And that was fine. We, we shut down London as with lockdown guidelines. Um, we're very fortunate. He's a very generous indiv individual um, and he kept everybody on full pay, no question. Mm -hmm. um, so we were incredibly fortunate with that mm -hmm. um, and we just got left to it and uh, so I was going in once a week to make sure that the property was still there and that everything was still going on and still working and just checking that all the properties were fine and then we gradually brought it back he's uh, yeah the principal's recently come back to Europe we're not expecting him back in London but he's got planes and helicopters he's mm -hmm. only two hours away um, and so now we've got to be we've got to be ready because I could get a message at any point saying he's coming back in this afternoon. <sighs> I probably won't, but he will expect just to be able to walk through that door whenever he likes, and it to be as if he never left, as if there's been no coronavirus, no no lockdown, no nothing. Since he's been gone, our head chef left. They were already planning on leaving. We've recruited a new head chef and a new housekeeper, so we've had to train them up. The head chef hasn't hasn't ever cooked for him before. So we're running full, full dummy dinner service, lunch service, uh, breakfast service, and just getting the chef cooking the food that he likes over and over and over again, just so that it's seamless. Um, yeah, it's, and it's been quite interesting trying to balance what his requirements will be when he comes back to with protecting the staff and not exposing them too much and implementing the social distancing measures within the properties. Um, and all of that it's a bit more relaxed now we've all been tested we're all being tested every week so so we're all completely clean we do yeah we zap people with thermometers as soon as they walk through the door every single day um 
gloves and masks for, for new people, um, for contractors and stuff. When they come in, everyone wash their hands immediately when they come in. So we put a few measures in. But also when he comes back, he doesn't want to feel like he's in a hospital. He doesn't want gloves. He doesn't want masks. He wants it to feel normal. So we're having to implement all of that invisibly almost. Um, so, I mean, that, 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 that's what I do now. I thoroughly enjoy it. Um, it's very exciting and it's got the best of both worlds. The immediate, fast-paced, think on your feet, boom, 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 boom quick reaction that I love um, but then also the slower property management the building projects the uh, yeah the renovations the staff management I really enjoy building a team and having a property work well and having it work seamlessly and you can feel it if a house works well it's, it's a lovely feeling it, it's just calm it's like a swan just smooth above the surface and all the paddling is just under the water you don't see it um mm. and it does just feel it feels really good when once the house is working a well oiled well oiled machine it's it's lovely and what's great about this industry i think is unlike you know big uh, corporate organizations where there's sort of like ceilings and where you can get to you know you can work up in your career but there's always more places you can go to so you know it's not you, there's no i wouldn't i don't think i've ever spoken to anyone in my career who could say i've reached the absolute peak of my career because there's always there's always another level another family higher level do you know what I mean so absolutely it'll be to what your future holds for you really exactly um there is I didn't realize how many levels there were when I started out mm. um and the higher you get the the more you realize and the more you're exposed to also there's it's the more that appears normal to you um, mm. when it's really really not um but and i always say the the higher the the higher up you get um, up the pyramid the smaller the circle is yeah and you, it does get smaller and smaller as you see less and less people being able to work at that sort of at yeah. that sort of level it's um which is which is really enjoyable and and but i don't feel maybe it's part of the perfectionist there's always more yeah, I, even as with my current in, uh, with my current principal, I'm very very happy doing this. But I'm seeing throughout the operation of ways it could be run better. Mm. Maybe it, there isn't currently a global property manager overseeing everything at the minute. It's house managers liaising mm. one to the other to the other to the other. There isn't a central point. So maybe that's something. Mm. Maybe maybe start your own company. Maybe do something like that. Who knows? Mm. Maybe stay what I'm doing. Mm. It, it works. It's fantastic. If it if something works for you and you're happy to to stay at that level and that is the level you want to be at. Yeah. Perfect. Maybe you want something more. Maybe you want something less. Everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And, life's and a game, and there's always that next level. Yeah, of course. And unless you're working with a principal who is retired, you are working for someone that's always pushing forward. So that the principal you work for is always going to be acquiring new homes, acquiring new players, acquiring new jacks, changing things, building things, renovating things. So a role is never really a sort of, uh, st you know, what do you call it? Like st stays the same, does it? Absolutely it's not. not. And, and even in my, even in my, with my short time with this principal, it's getting bigger. Yeah. No, these roles, they never, they never get smaller. They never get smaller. Um, and as soon as you, if you want something done, give it to a busy person. Yeah. And, and it, every, more and more comes on all the time, especially when the answer is always yes. <laughs> exactly. Oh, and I know what that, thank you so much for coming on and talking to me. Like, good place to start, good no, place to start with. I think it's great to talk to somebody. What's inspiring about your story is you didn't have a career in hospitality. Um, what age were you when it said you were eight, 30 when you joined the industry? I was, yeah, I was 30 when I started, yes. So, you, you know, you don't have to have been at Chelsea since the age of 16 to have to have, yeah. have these opportunities. You also were able to step in at a house management level. You didn't have to go right back down to, you know, some junior housekeeper and work your way up, which is cool. No. Um, and you've had the opportunity to work with some very high profile people, which is, you know, thrown in the deep end. But you've, I was going to say you've seen, seen it all and done it all, but you definitely wouldn't have seen it all and done it all. But you've, you've certainly... Uh, 
um, had a good foundation, <laughs> good foundation of your career anyway. Absolutely, you get a, yeah, my, my, my whole belief is that if you've got everything under control, then when the panic comes in, you've only got one panic. Yeah. If you, if you can't control everything on a normal day-to-day -day basis, then it only takes one thing to, and all the plates go flying. Yeah. Um, whereas if everything's under control and you're calm and you've got systems in place, yeah. then you can, you can take on anything. You can take anyone. Famous last words. Well, thank you very much, Russell. Thank you so much. No problem, no problem. Speak to you soon. Bye. Cheers, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.